Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Roxana Valeton. I'm originally from Cuba. And I, you can hear me right now? Yes? Let me see. Is it? Is it video. Oh, okay. That's what that one's for. And then this one, just make sure it's in front of me. You're constantly. They want to stand in the middle, too. It's okay with me. Sponsor. Are you good there? Yeah, it's fine. All right, just make sure. I just want to, because I have the questions here. You want to try? Yes. What about now? Yes. Better? Okay. Um, so good morning again. My name is Roxana Valeton and originally from Cuba and I um, came to this town in 2014. So it's been over seven years me here and I fell in love uh, with the people, with everything here. So now um, I kind of feel that I, I belong, right? So uh, Ernie came yesterday and I want to thank Ernie for giving me the opportunity to talk about what I do and I believe that a lot of you knows about what an, an FQAC is. So an FQAC is a federally qualified health center. It's, um, uh, these are organizations, healthcare organizations that we help the underserved communities in your town. So we are considered a safety, safety net for the healthcare community. And not, everybody, not everyone knows about us because um, Everybody believe, because we said the underserved, that when you go to our clinics, you're gonna find an ugly place or full of homeless. So in uh, certain areas, you might find a lot of homeless in our clinics, but it's not everywhere. You can, we also have uh, beautiful facilities. We are, you might not find us in Summerlin or nice places in Henderson, but uh, we see pretty much everybody, not only the underserved. So the health center um, program was founded in 1975. And we have hundreds of thousands of locations nationwide. So this is very important program that the government put together so our clinics see those patients that no one wants to see or they cannot afford to pay in the private uh, clinics, we are here to serve them. So what uh, the government did is that they put together a program and they, um, they uh, put uh, money allocations per state. So normally between one and three years, you find if you go to Grand.gov, which is public records, you can find um, a new opportunity to open, open clinic like the ones we have right here. So in our state, we have a total of 12 health centers in Nevada. So basically, this state uh, coming from Florida that we have hundreds. If you see California, they have hundreds too. Um, I saw the opportunity, you know, to come. I came as a consultant um, to see what's going on in, in Nevada that not too many people are, or organizations are applying for this program that is so important um, for actually the city. It's very important because I, uh, we are the ones, like I said, that serve those homeless out there, um, those people without insurance. We are there to help them. So when I came here, I was surprised, uh, honestly with you, uh, when I came seven years ago. But at that time, I, I was like, we are here like 10 years behind. Why? Because when I came, coming from Florida, HMO, no one was, uh, wanted to be contacted with an HMO. And when I was talking to doctors, they said, no, the thing is that we get paid within 10 days. Why should I be, you know, enrolled with an HMO plan? And I was surprised, I said, well, that's, this is, you know, interesting. And I saw the opportunity, and uh, here in Las Vegas, there were only two FQACs. I was like, wow, if you go to California, there are every five blocks, you find one. And it's very competitive in there because you, has, you have um, only a few, you know, the population grows and not everybody's homeless, not everybody's underserved. So the more FQACs you have, because we have to meet a lot of requirements, being one, the number of patients we serve, uh, it was kind of hard. So here I saw the opportunity uh, and I, like I said, two years after, 
I have Glenn here asked me to join another nonprofit that they were an FQC lookalike, meaning that they didn't have fund funding because there, there are two types of FQACs. One on the 330 funding that normally the government give you when you apply and you know you present a location, what you're gonna do, they give you a minimum of $650,000 for your operations. And then um, when you get that allocation, if you get approved, then you can apply for more funding uh, meaning you can add funding for mental health if you have providers. You can also uh, apply for a dental program if that's what you, know, you want to do. And there are many programs including family planning with the state. So right now that we have a lot of uh, problems like people don't want it, you know, women, women rights and all of that. Or, or, um, so we, may, we become a part of the solution because uh, all those females, those programs that they were closed because of everything happening right now, we can offer services uh, to those women if they know if they want to uh, get an abortion because we cannot do that under Section 330. But we can help them with education, like you know what you should do to prevent pregnancy if you don't want to, uh, if you don't want a child, right? That's most important than anything. And if they need, you know, advice about all the things we tell them where to go and things like that, but we don't get involved. So, uh, like I was saying, in other state we have 12, but um, when you're really counting, it's only nine. Because what is happening right now is that, because we haven't been aggressive, applying to these particular clinics, we have folks from all the states applying here. Why? Because in, in California, there is no more space for FQACs. So guess what? We have one that named, the name is All for Health, Health for All, that they are huge in California and they have now locations in Nevada. We have uh, another one case for Arizona that it also has a location in, in Nevada. And we have, um, we have three of them. One is in a rural area, but it's in the border. So it's basically three that they're not from Nevada. And the reason why I don't count them among the 12 is because when your main location is in another state, when they allocate more money to your organization, you, it, that money is counted in the other state. So that, even though they are investing, in our state, the money goes to the main account. So that's why I'm saying that we only have nine, which is nothing compared with other states. And I do believe that if you don't know about the program, we should be encouraging more organizations and um, people that you know maybe they don't have enough funds to start a business in healthcare. They should be shaking this program because it's very interesting. And I'm going to talk more about you know how we get pay and all of that. Um, no, we are not, but we can decide. We are like many hospitals. Uh, our claims, are, we build institutional claims like, in a, like a hospital. So basically, as long as we change our scope, because our basics is pro to provide primary care. That's our basics. Besides that, we can are different specialties, but we have to inform the government. And before we, we implement anything, we have to go through a change in scope and we need to uh, explain uh, why we are adding this specialty. Uh, I have to add a need assessment about you know the area, my, tar my target population, and then HRSA will approve it or not. So where do you send them? When you send them to the emergency room? Or you're not open? We are not open. Normally we are not open. Uh, and one reason being is because we see patients regardless if they can afford to pay or not. So imagine how hard it is to um, maintain a business. It's a for-profit that if people, they don't pay, you, can t you tell them, I'm so sorry, but if you cannot pay your copayment, I cannot see you, right? We can do that. So we have to have a sliding scale um, based on um, income, you know, family income, individual in income. And if that person comes and they are acting in good faith and they tell us, I'm so sorry, I'm going through a lot, I only have $5. Guess what? We have to see them. 
if they say, I have zero dollars, we have to see them. So imagine how hard, you know, at least for me as a CEO, uh, we have to have that balance of how many uninsured or insured patients we see, because if it's hard to keep a business sustainable, charging everybody, imagine not charging everybody. Because some days, you might have 80% of your clientele that they are not able to pay you. And you have to see them, and you have to provide the same uh, quality of uh, healthcare. And even more, because we have a lot of audits. Uh, we get audited um, yearly, and our audits are very complex. Normally, they are, uh, we have to select a third party uh, company that has experience with the government, and they get to go to our facility three days, and we have to present the policies we have and procedures ahead of time, and they get to meet each of our employees. So they basically ask questions directly to them to make sure we're following all of these policies. Yes, so with the FQEC program under 330 and the lookalike as well, we have, uh, that comes with a 340B program. So the 340B program is a uh, pharmacy discount program that allows our FQACs to buy uh, medications to pharmaceuticals almost at cost. Meaning that um, if we have, uh, let's say you go to Walmart and you need Lantus, and maybe Walgreens has the Lantus for $150 a month, that it might be less expensive that if you, your insurance, what your insurance is paying. So with us, the Lantus might cost us $25. So what we do with that uh, money, we transfer those savings to our clients. So we don't make a penny with the uninsured patients. We transfer, the, so if it costs us 25, we give it to the patient at $25. So that's uh, very unique from our program and uh, that is why most of the uh, insurances in the state like to collaborate with FQACs. That's why hospitals love to collaborate with FQACs. Why? Because that case worker in the hospital or the referral person, we're like a one-stop shop. So if they call a private entity, they say, I have an uninsured patient. They're gonna tell you, oh, so sorry, you know, we don't, they try not to see them because, you know, we all understand this is business and we need to pay our bills, right? And the more uninsured you have, it becomes a problem. So with us, if they have insurance, we say yes. If they don't have insurance, we say yes. Um, and we have so many, uh, most of us, we have a specialty care in-house and the reason being is because when you start as an FQAC only covering primary care, it's very hard to tell a patient you are sick, but at the time you refer out, then that person might have to pay 200, 300 out there. So the first thing uh, I did in, in our company is to bring mental health. Why? Because I know how much it costs to see a psychiatrist and how hard is to see a psychiatrist. So right now we count with 24 providers. Uh, we have two, um, one psychiatrist has PAs that has certification inside that my, my psychiatrist supersedes. So he works for us four days a week. So that's what, one of the things when I came to town, uh, I was concerned because everybody told me that there was a lot of competition because it was a lot of mental health clinics. Well, what I did, I started calling everybody around me. And guess what, I found out that the same provider was working in more than five clinics. And the same provider was available maybe twice a month in that clinic, meaning that there was no competition. So I don't really believe in competition just because we are all different and even though we copy and paste what we do, we're gonna have, the end result is gonna be different because we're different. So our culture in, in our organizations you know, we, we do it differently, for the better, for the worse. Yes, yeah, so we have right now um, mental health. Yeah, so we do have, even though we are trying to add more specialty care, that way uh, we really help our clients when they 
they have to go somewhere else. So we, we try to add cardiology. Why? Because we have so many people with cardiac issues. Uh, we have rheumatologists. So I found out we have a handful of rheumatologists in town. So what we did, I, I met uh, this wonderful doctor, Betty Young, and he did his residence in the United States, but he was from Lebanon. And so I contacted the state, and we were able to bring the doctor to, uh, to J-1 visa. He's very grateful, hardworking, and I don't know one patient that goes to see him that doesn't speak highly about him. So that was a great. So bringing diversity to your business, that's very important too. Because when you are immigrant, you think differently. You are very grateful, like me, like myself, that we are in this country and we have so many opportunities. Uh, so what I'm uh, trying to say, we collaborate. So it doesn't matter if we have mental health, I'll be willing to collaborate with any of you that have a mental health company. Why? Because we don't get paid more to bring the patient so many times, right? So we uh, have to um, report to the government yearly. It's a UDS um, report that we report demographics, how many patients, female, male, financials, uh, quality measurements. It's a huge report. It's like a book. And if I bring the same patients every two weeks to my office, that's a, no, that's a time that I cannot bring a new patient that might need our help. So for us, if we have case workers, so what happens is that when the patient comes to our facility, we are lucky that in our state, pretty much everybody can apply for Medicaid. It's very easy. You know, if you're not working, if you're pregnant, if many things. So we try to educate them how to apply. We help them navigate in the system. So that way we have more insured patients because the more insured patients we have, the more uninsured we can help. So what happens with that is that it's not an intention to bring a patient three times a month. So uh, if the patient already have insurance and uh, we uh, educate them, they get healthier, if they need to go outside, we send them outside to be able to help another client that is sicker than that one. Okay, so that, and, and, uh, that way I can report also, we serve this many patients and this many are underinsured, this many uninsured, so we have to report all of that. So uh, for us, it doesn't really matter how many times they come to our office. You know, it's, how many we serve, especially if they're underserved, that's very important for us to report. So we can collaborate with anybody. We normally don't keep our, the patients. So if you have an agency and you need to send the patients to us, we normally send them back. We, we, we don't, you know, like, like I said, I work in private companies. I have a private company for many years. So you, you, be, you tend to be um, kind of protective you think that you own the patients, right? So you're like, oh, that, that clinic took my patients. No, we don't take any patients. Patients leave if they're not happy. That, that's what happens. So for me, if, uh, when I collaborate with other entities, I would rather if my providers, sometimes we have difficult patients, we know that. So if I'm... How does it work in terms of getting to the hospital? Do you have your own contract with the hospital? Yes, we have a contract with Bali, uh, health system, but that's one of the things that is not only for FKCs, even for private companies. Sometimes it gets too bureaucratic, right? So even though some companies in town wants to become part of the system, wants to be in the list, so we get referrals, sometimes it's hard. But we do have a good collaboration yeah, with Bali Healthcare System. Yes, we do, but not all of the FKCs uh, has that contract. Yeah, because the thing is that with the hospitals, they will tell you if we give you a contract, you have to accept my client within 72 hours. You have to, you know, there are, there are requirements too. Uh, so it's not really a liability, but at least in our company, we sign, you want to deliver, right? And especially right now that we are all understaffed, especially with the entry level positions, uh, just to answer the phone, is a problem. 
but we do have, uh, we love to have more collaboration agreements with more hospitals because um, these patients, that especially the uninsured, when they go to the hospital, it costs more to the system. It costs more to the hospital. It costs all of us more. But if they're on Medicaid, then that contract overrides your contract, for you mean uh, for the hospital? Yeah, so there's, this, these are two, let's say um, uh, inpatient and outpatient, I'm sorry, it's, it's different. Uh, so what our providers do, we have providers that are hospitalists too. So we have two infection disease MDs. When the patient goes to the hospital, um, because they understand the cost, uh, they try to keep them out of the hospital sooner and we follow them up in our clinics. And so one of the questions you put in here was the infusion center. So we are setting up an infusion center in our organization. One, because infusion uh, drugs are very expensive. Like I was talking to you yesterday, neurologists, right? Some of the drugs, neurologists, they don't even want to administer those medications in their facility because the liability is too high and they have to spend 4,000, 5,000 for one, you know, two milligrams or whatever liquid of one certain medications. And if the patient didn't show up and the medication had to be prepared before, they lost their money. If it, it, many things can happen and so what happened is that they decide not to and the patient ends up at the hospital which costs 10 times, not only the $4,000. And for those $4,000 they might get reimbursed 4,300, meaning that they only made $300 or $500. For an FQAC, that medication might cost us even cents, okay? So what happened is that this 340B pharmacy program is given to us so we are sustainable even if we don't have grants. So what we can do, and we normally do, we try to negotiate with insurance plans and say, okay, you normally pay for 4,300 for this medication, but because you know that we can get a lower cost, we're accepting half of the money. The thing is that we normally bill the same amount because the money we make with our 340B program, we allocate for the uninsured because someone has to pay for the uninsured when they say, I don't have money to pay. You know, we cover their labs, their basic labs, we cover um, IUD, you know, IUD, FEMA, we know they cost $800 because I got a bill for the insurances and it's $800, $1,200 just to put a next plan on or to put an IUD. It costs a lot of money. Uh, we cover those through our family planning program with the state because we have not only uh, grants from the federal government, we also can apply for grants with the state. And I wanted to tell you that the grants are not only for nonprofits. You can all apply for grants too, especially in a state like ours. When they receive three applications for the total of five million and they have 10 million available, they will give it to you. But they just wanna make sure they give it to companies that they know how to manage the money and nonprofits, no one owns a nonprofit. That's why some investors and private entities, they don't wanna get involved because you don't really control, you know, even if you put money, you don't really control what is gonna happen. Uh, but we have board members, as, uh, with the FQACs, you need to have nine to 25 board members, and 51% needs to be consumers, meaning that 51% has to be active patients of your health center. And that's hard. That, that means on the board? Wow. On really? the board, yes. So when you say not for profit, you, you mean St. Jersey State, Glenn Amador, the, the, the congregation that he's never been not for profit in his life. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, Glenn is our board uh, chairman, and uh, he basically funded and he actually put money in the organization <coughs> initially because even though we're a nonprofit, we give free service, not free services, but discount services, and if people cannot afford to pay, we basically uh, waive the amount once a year. Everybody, with, every, every, everybody working in our organizations, we pay them. I don't have one employee that works for free. And we have to pay the same rate 
they get paid in private companies. If, if not, they won't work for us. You might have a handful of people that they love to work in FQEC, they know what we do, and they might get a price cut here and there. But uh, right now, in this market that is so competitive, it's almost impossible. So how come you don't get along with my son? Oh, oh no, no. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> No, so the <laughs> so FQAC is I don't know if you noticed um, HMO plans like like I said before coming from Florida everybody has to be enrolled in an HMO regardless if you have Medicaid or Medicare. I do believe that is the program is amazing, right? Because um, some doctors they tend to prescribe more than they should. They repeat you know, what they're referring to. And we need to understand that in order for doctors to make more money or entities, uh, the insurances, they do have to make money. You will live in the United States and now that's how it works. But on the other hand, I do believe that we have taken so much, um, I won't say power from our doctors. It's kind of like, kind of disrespectful sometimes. So you get to go to school as a doctor and uh, for 10, 15 years, and when you sit and you put, I need the aspirin for my patient, you get a call from the insurance that is not even a doctor telling you, I'm so sorry, you cannot prescribe that. So I, I, I believe that a lot of problems we have, like the sh mass shooting we got for these kids in the school, that's, that's sad, okay? So, but we keep, we keep taking from doctors the clinical power, you know, decision-making power and I don't think that's right. We need to allow doctors to be doctors. And if they make a mistake to ordering one more time something, maybe they're afraid, maybe they, they said, I'm not finding what is the cause, let me repeat the, this, right? So instead of taking you know, all this uh, power from them, that you know, when you're a kid, you go to a doctor, even your mom, your mom takes you to a doctor, when you get there, your mom feels relief. They say, they're already with the doctor, they'll be fine, right? And our, our, the doctors make decisions they wanna make, and when they, they feel free, that they can order whatever they want, and they can do whatever they want, I think they work better. But right now, I feel bad when I have to tell my providers, productivity report, you have to see patient every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, that does bad. That's bad. And then I don't understand why pharmacies, they have a different reimbursement methodology. So when you go to your pharmacy, I don't know if you uh, know this, but you come with your insurance, they run your insurance, and in their computer, because we do have a pharmacy program, you see how much you're gonna get paid immediately, instantly. And you can pay that amount. With doctors, with you know, with our practices, that doesn't happen. You see the patient, regardless if you see them, um, you spend too much time with them or not, you need to weigh if the insurance pays or not. Sometimes they pay you and they want the money back because you forgot to put something in your notes, okay? So I think that needs to change. To, because, uh, you know, at least a little bit, I understand that, you know, there is a fine line and we, unfortunately, we have providers and entities that they overbill, that maybe they're not providing services, but I'm not talking about those. Those will always be there. And hopefully, they get caught eventually. I'm talking about the majority, the doctors, that they, they study because they want to help the communities. They want to make you feel better. You know, they want you to trust them but we are not allowing them to do their job. And that's why, like I said, we have so many people getting killed because when they go to the psychiatrist or the psychologist or the therapist, they don't have enough time to see them. And these people, they need more time. But guess what, the doctor, especially if you are a small company, a private company, you have to pay your bills. So you're like, I'm so sorry, but sir, I have, you have to go. Uh, I still love you. Okay, so we uh, normally, uh, if you call our, our company, uh, most of our employees, they're amazing. So they're always looking for things. They call me the weekends and say, hi, Roxana, we have clothing. Should we take it to the clinic? We have a food pantry. 
Uh, we collaborate not only with Three Square, sometimes we collaborate with restaurants in town, uh, even hotels. They gave us the, the soap, you know, that when they, they use them, they gave it to us, and I think they do a process, and, you know, we get um, donations, but they're less and less all the time, you know, because every, it's very hard, like I said, to keep uh, a business sustainable. So even private entities, they try to keep, if they have leftovers, because they don't know if they're gonna have leftover the next month. Uh, but we actively receive, can be medications. So we have patients that if family member die, they give us, uh, they say, okay, we have a hospital bed. And if we have a patient that they don't have insurance, you know, we call them immediately and say, you know, someone is giving us a hospital bed, would you like to have it? And, you know, we have those. Uh, we have a program uh, that we give medication for free for 90 days, but it depends what is available. So we give that to, to our clients. Uh, to our 340B, we helped a lot. Uh, talking back about the HMO plans, so what happened with the HMO plans is that in other states, the reimbursement is higher than here. So when I was working in Florida, I remember my reimbursement was for 90 to $120 per member per month. Okay, when I came here, that I signed my first contract was $40, $45 per member per month. So how can you help a senior that is very demanding, they're sick, you know, they have to come often. Sometimes they don't even have a family and they see their doctor as a family. So when sometimes they come to just talk to you, just talk to your employees. So I couldn't understand how you can make it work, right? And I don't care if you tell me, oh, I'm doing great. Uh, you're not with $40 per, per member per month, okay? So because, you know, I've been there, I do my math and I have to pay bills in my business and I, I'm the one signing checks. So I do know how that works. And, in the, in the long run, yeah, it's a, a great um, program and you get benefits if you do certain things, but it takes time. So during that time, who is paying for everything? Because it's a lot. So one of the things I did like when I was, uh, that I like here actually is that regardless of insurance, patients came with their copayment normally, you know? Um, in Florida, and forgive me that I'm, I'm mentioning Florida, People, they don't want to pay payments. If they give you blood, they want money. They want money for everything. And you know why? Because, because of competition, we try to add more services that are not related to healthcare. And that's very unfortunate. So I get to the point that I have clients calling me and say, hi, Roxana, do you, do you offer transportation? Do you, uh, do you give uh, meals and breakfast to the clients? Uh, do you celebrate birthday? I'm like, you haven't asked me if we have good providers. I'm so sorry, but we cannot help you here, right? And people don't like it because of that, because everybody's offering hair, nail, and I'm like, we're not a cafeteria, we're not a hair salon. When you call your doctor, at least in my opinion, I wanna see a good doctor. I don't wanna go to my clinic to dance. And we have folks here coming and bringing that culture now. And that's not good, <laughs> that is not good, because we all are gonna pay, and, and are paying, because we're gonna have more patients asking for those things that are not related to healthcare. So I know we wanna make it competitive, we wanna be competitive, but I think we should, we should be investing in all the things related to healthcare, to make our clinics competitive. Because at the end, if we pay more a doctor, more than, average or let's say they get paid well, if we try to pay more, we're not making money and then the other company will have to pay the same or more and then it's gonna be unsustainable for everybody. So we, we bring that culture here, like, you know, I still believe that this is a great state and I still have patients that comes and say, this is my co-payment, I'm, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Because they're respecting what they sign with their insurance. So when we asked a patient to give us a copayment, we didn't sign that contract. The patient signed that contract with insurance. So, you know, we need to educate, you know, our patients and our, our doctors too. And so that's why the back, coming, going back to the HMO um, program, I think it's great, but what happens is that 
in my opinion, one of the things that we don't get that high reimbursement in our state is because we just started with the HMO in this state. So it takes years for the government to allocate money to your state based on how many people are sick in your state. So in Florida, HMO plan start, was the pioneers in HMO. So they have been reporting to the government people with diseases for over 50 years. That's why they get more reimbursement. We just started because it was so good to get a payment back in 10 days from Medicare, you know, fee for service Medicare or Medicaid that, you know, it takes time for the government to say, yeah, in Nevada we have this many seniors with this many problems. This is one of the reasons. There are many other things that also impact the payment we get in our state. But even with Medicaid, the same thing, you know, to get capitation in pretty much in all states, uh, you get a per member per month money, you know, even with Medicaid. It's a small amount, but in town we don't have that. Only maybe one, um, you know, insurance is offering that, like two, three dollars per member per month, and that's very helpful. First of all, this one is not for free. They will take it from you at the end of whatever money you get for your quality measurements. Uh, but that helps you get a uh, hire a caseworker, hire a phone coordinator to call these members to come to your office in the meantime. So any anything that the in, insurances pay upfront, they can take it from you at the end. But that's something that will help you operate your business, especially now. So, so that's that's one thing that I do believe that all uh, insurances in town should be implementing with private and non-profit entities as well to make processes better. Because at the end, I know they are asked, I need you to report this percentage to the state, this and that, and they come to us and they said, okay, if you don't do this, this and that, I cannot pay you. Uh, but if the, if the money component is not involved, it's impossible to make things happen. So what's your breakdown on so um, uh, Medicaid, I believe, uh, I think Medicare. it's like a 60, me Medicare, we only have like 6% of Medicare clients. And I'm telling you why. Normally, we bring a lot of Medicare, but Medicare patients, they don't want to be in a lobby that they have a kid crying. Or maybe one homeless came to the, to the lobby. Uh, they are used to beautiful facilities that everybody is dressed up, right, mm -hmm. dressing up. and. Uh, like I said, they, they have maybe coffee, they have all the things in there, and, and that's done huge. And that's sponsored grants here who have designed your, what, designing your new facility? Yes. I appreciate your sponsoring this. And <laughs> and yes, we're planning to, um, to open a new facility in North Las Vegas, uh, hopefully soon, and um, to make things better, but like I said, you know, when, when it comes to seniors, and I did a lot of seniors, I had a great uh, um, program in, the, in, in Florida with seniors. They like to be in, in places that is more quiet, uh, that they get more attention, and we have to see, um, serve everybody the same way. And w you need to kind of pamper them a lot for them to come back. And they're all school, and we have employees I, I believe everybody's going through the same thing. It's been very hard to keep uh, employee morale up during these difficult times. So Medicaid, you do what? Medicaid. So Medicaid, uh, we are like a 62, 65 percent. 62. Yeah, because pretty much everyone can apply for Medicaid and Medicare. And the rest are private insurances. Yeah, so normally we don't have that many uninsured uh, patients right now. Uh, after the pandemic, more people can apply and get approved. Uh, in the past, we had uh, almost 30% of uninsured. Uh, we see patient regards, so we just need an ID, even if it's higher, a photo ID, it doesn't matter. Do you collect code names? We do collect, we, we encourage people to collect, uh, uh, our employees to collect the co-payments, but if uh, the patient said, today I don't have the co-payment, what we do, they have to apply for uh, the sliding scale. That's 
they have to apply for the sliding scale because it's illegal for us not to collect copayment. So what we do, if they can afford to pay, they do a sign scale and that becomes like a second insurance for them. So we can do a payment plan and it, at the end, if they can afford to pay, we write off at the, uh, once a year, those send amounts. Them out the huh? you send them out the collections? We never send patients to collections. The only, one, the only one that we have to send to collections is the insured patients that they didn't apply for a sliding scale. Because if I offer you the sliding scale, meaning that you're telling me that you are underinsured, because maybe your deductibles are really high and you say no to that, it's because you have money. That's what I interpret. Because if you really can't afford to pay, you just need to fill out two pieces of papers. And that's it. So, well, yeah. So, yeah, we, so well, that's um, what we do. Um, I have a, there's a question here do they belong to any ACOs? So, um, we can collaborate with ACOs actually, but because we have so many requirements, so we have to report to the government, to states, uh, to so many entities. Then we add an ACO, it uh, becomes overwhelming. Even though it can be easy because we're already reporting all the things. Do you have a compliance officer that keeps up with all this? Yes. Actually, uh, <laughs> when. <laughs> so we have, a, so we have to have, actually, we have to have a CMO, CO, CFO. We have a CFO full time. We have basic an accounting department because we have to do uh, grant management. Um, Basically, we, we are assigned a project officer from the government, and um, I write grants, so that's easy for our company, because we don't have to pay for a grant writer to write grants, and they can be very costly. Um, and then you do the grant management monthly. You have to report quarterly, monthly, yearly, um, meaning how you spend the dollars and the results, what you, you, know, what you did or not. So yeah, we, we have to have, um, basically we have to open job opportunities. That's one part of what, who we are, not only to serve the uninsured, but we also create jobs in the communities we serve. Yeah. How many employees do you have? Right now we, uh, we have uh, close to 90 employees. 90? Close to 90. Wow. Mm -hmm. And your biggest competitor is like I said, it's not really competitors because they say Nevada Health Center is the first FQAC in town. I have good relationship with all the CEOs and even with the health district that they just became an FQAC as well recently, like two years ago. Uh, I work with everybody and let's say Nevada Health Centers, they don't have rheumatologists. So they have to send patients to us. Uh, if they have a dental program, our dental program is really small. So. If we have a patient that we cannot see within a week, we, we send it to them. How many? I'm how many sorry. Physicians? Oh. Nurses. oh, nurses we do. So we have 24 providers in, in general. Uh, we have two nurses right now. Uh, we're hiring two more because of infection, uh, infusion center. So we're hiring two more. Uh, like I said, it's becoming really difficult to hire MAs and uh, LPNs, RNs, those three levels. It's very difficult because um, all the big companies are not really worried because um, I try to myself to diversify and educate myself about different things even not related to healthcare. I Meaning, let's say the store market, what is happening in the store market, uh, what is happening in companies around us. So right now, because they, their reports are so bad, you know, they, they had to spend a lot of money. So investors are pulling, stock market is crashing. Now they have to let go of people. So it's, a, it's just about time that we're gonna get all those semis applying again to our entities. I never played that game of um, paying double. I had MAs, uh, I don't know, they became kind of disrespectful. I had a couple of MAs that they, we were in an interview and they were like, if you don't pay me 25, I don't work for you. I'm like, I'm not looking for a job. You know, that's, that's very, 
that's very disrespectful. You're looking for a job. You don't, you don't say that. You can say, you know, I would love to get this star salary and whatever it is, you can explain. But for me, that's unacceptable. And so what I did, because I had so many people applying and saying this, I said, okay, no, we, you know what? I can offer you that, but you need to meet these requirements here. So you have to um, uh, spend within a year 50 grand or more if the, if, the, if the business is not doing well. You might not get paid sometimes if I don't receive payment for the insurances. So you need to kind of invest in the business if you want to get paid double of, you know, because you don't know what it takes to keep a business alive. And you don't know if I did get paid or not if we didn't receive payment. I secure my employees' salaries, but if we don't have enough, sometimes I don't get paid. Would you do that? You know, are you willing to do that? So you get more, more salary. Because when you open a private company, sometimes you don't get paid for two years, and you invest your money, and you invest, and you don't even know if you're gonna make it. But when everything is going is good, then everybody starts asking for more money. And they're not thinking that you're just recouping the money you lost the last two years. So it's unfortunate, and it's unfortunate that everything is going, you know, everything is so expensive right now. And I do understand, I do understand that we need to invest in our employees, that's very important. So $10 is not enough. But I realized that the 25 became the $10 because with 25, they cannot even pay their bills. So if you believe that by paying more, they're gonna be happier and more productive, it's not gonna happen. So for me, I try to find people that they're mission-oriented, people that I can trust, and they're willing to learn. And then, everything else. Because those people, even if you cannot afford to pay them a lot, they do their best. And that would translate into money, into your companies. And then with money, we can do anything. So nowadays we cannot control our expenses, but we can control our income by maximizing and diversifying and being more flexible, especially with the new generation. I have pharmacists right now, very, very young. Roxana, I would love to work in your company, but I would like to work from home two days because I have two kids and I want, I want time for my kids. Um, I go like this salary, I go like this, and I go like that. I said, okay, let me think about it, right? So, and then I, sometimes I get back to them and I say, yeah, that can be possible if you do A, B, and C, and D. So you're asking for a lot, right? And I think that's why I've been able to grow in my company. That's why we have so many providers. For all you to know, I don't write contracts to any of my providers. I just send an email of how much I'm gonna pay them, they agree, you know, the, you know, the, re the requirements we have to go through, uh, what they're responsible for, but I don't sign contract for them. Why? Because I don't want anyone in my company that doesn't want to be in the company. Because that will make everybody's life miserable. So it's like, like I said, oh, oh, we're open for collaborations. It doesn't matter if we have the providers in house, we have many patients, so only our, our location in downtown, we serve more than 100 patients daily, and we have five locations. So we do have a contract with Clark County the School District. So we have two uh, school-based clinics, uh, one dental clinic, and I wrote a grant for SAMHSA. So we just got uh, approved for a 24-7 crisis intervention center. So we're in the process of working with Metro. Uh, so that way, those clients that are crazy and they're no criminals, they don't go to jail. They go to a doctor. Uh, so we're in the process of finalizing that. Um, you know, we hope to keep growing and keep collaborating with everybody. And the insurances, I, I hope that, that, that uh, one more thing I wanted to say that in our state we don't have that many providers, but one thing that can help is that if the insurances accept uh, MDs automatically, let's say when they're out of school, that they don't have any issues, or because you study to become a doctor and then when you apply, it takes forever. So how are you gonna feed your family if you are trained to be a doctor and the insurance they're not allowing you to be part of their network? So in my opinion, if our state accepts MDs, if they don't have any issues, if they have issues, they can do their processes and accept whoever they want, right? But if you don't have any problem in your license, welcome that provider. 
make it easier for them to open their practice or to work for someone else. That company, you know, will be able to, you know, they'll put patients in there and it's gonna become better and I think we're gonna attract more MDs in our state if we do that. I think that, that will be uh, one of the uh, things that I think can be done. I know it takes time, but if, we, if we're able to do that, we're gonna bring a lot of doctors here. with Centene. Actually, uh, honestly, that's one of the programs that understand more FQACs. Yeah, but you know, the, the other ones are getting there and we receive help for pretty much all the insurances. It's a win-win for both of us anyway. Yeah, we can contract with anybody. It doesn't have to be uh, FQAC per se, but so let's say if you have a clinic and it has to be non-profit, uh, rural hospitals, they do have the 340B program, um, HIV clinics that has Ryan Y, they do have 340B program. Do any of the hospitals do 340B here in town? Most of them, they have to be rural hospitals. Oh, okay. I do yeah. believe that we have one in Henderson, uh, but we don't have that many, but um, different programs like hemophilia patients too. Outstanding. Thank you. I'm sorry that uh, 